And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance. Questions 7 and 12 have been withdrawn, and I call Robbie Butler. Number one, please. Minister. With your permission, Concord, I will answer questions 1 and 3 together as they both relate to health and the social care le- levy. My officials are in discussion with the Treasury around the health and social care levy and how it will impact on the Executive's budget. However, I understand that there will be a legal obligation for the cash, to be raised, the cash raised from the levy to be directed to health and social care. For clarity, while the announcement referenced £400 million, this included levy-funded spend which is not England-specific, such as vaccine costs, and as such will not give rise to a Barnet consequential. The actual funding provided to the Executive will not be known until the spending review outcome, but the current estimation is that the Executive will receive an average annual amount of £300 million. The Executive recognises the importance of directing funding to our health service, and this will be a wider consideration in the local budget process. My recommendation will be that funding provided by the levy should be ring fenced for health. Thank the Minister um, for his answer. The, the Minister has now uh, given us some tangible uh, figures in around the, the reduction from 400 to 300 million. Could you maybe uh, expand on that a little bit for us to, to understand just where that gap would be? Yes, uh, as I was saying uh, when I was responding, some, some of the, the, the figures when you, when you just brought them across each of the devolved areas uh, allocated are, uh, it's appeared to in, indicate that we were receiving a receipt of 400 million. But some of that spend is not England specific spend, therefore it does not become a Barnet consequential for us. Some of that is, is broader spend in terms of vaccine, which the cost would be attributed to all of us. So our estimation, and this is yet to be confirmed, uh, and will only be confirmed, I suppose, uh, finally in, in uh, the outcome of the spent review at the end of October. Uh, but our estimation, current estimation, is that there's more like three hundred million than four hundred million pounds. Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, as we enter another winter, we're all mindful of the pressures faced by the NHS. Can I ask what other plans there are to ensure the health care budget is prioritised? Thank you. Well, I uh, thank the member for his question. As he will know that we are, have begun the exercise of planning for a multi-annual uh, budget outcome. Uh, and uh, This, obviously, is what we have been seeking for many years, uh, because in order to address the longer-term transformation issues within the health service and tackling some of the issues like waiting lists, we need recurrent funding uh, to make sure that we have the staff in the health service that can carry that on. And That was never possible under a, a one-year annual budget scenario. So now that we have got uh, uh, clear that we're having a three-year budget, uh, the executive have already begun planning. and I have put uh, a paper to the executive uh, identifying that health has been our consistent priority right across the executive since we came back uh, in January 2020 and that we need to consider then how we would meet the, the requirements of the health department. And of course, health uh, interests span beyond the health department, but in, in, in cert- in certainly in the primary area in relation to uh, acute services and, and that it would be through the health department. So we have also been talking to the health department itself about its needs, uh, what it thinks it would require in terms of transformation, and then that is the discussion the executive will be getting down to hopefully in the next week or so uh, to begin to match some funding towards that priority or some estimated funding, because we won't know the amount until the end of October, uh, but towards that priority to make sure that we can actually plan to have a better outcome for health over the next three years than we have been having over the last number of years. I call Colin Giller now. And I uh, thank the Minister for his answers to date, especially in light of the severe pressures that our health and social care services are under, both in terms of demand and in terms of provision of services. And can I ask the Minister what discussions you have had, Minister, with your executive colleagues to ensure that health will be prioritised in the forthcoming budget? Well, my own department has been talking to the other departments over the course of the summer uh, in, relation, in relation to the budget uh, outcome and the, the budget planning that we need to do uh, ahead of the outcome of the spent review at the end of October, uh, so that we are ready actually to draft and launch a, a draft budget uh, and go out to public consultation as quickly as we possibly can then beyond that point. Uh, and so of course, I have, as I have said in the previous response, I have written to the uh, executive colleagues. I, I, I spoke to this at the executive meeting last Thursday. I reminded people that our priority had consistently been supporting the health service, and that was probably more acute uh, even than when we, when we came in in January 2020. The, the needs of the health service itself uh, are more pronounced now than ever. Uh, and so we will need to consider, uh, firstly, in, in dialogue with the health minister and his department, what the requirements are, and then the executive are going to have to take some decisions in terms of prioritisation. We don't know what the outcome of the spent review will be. 
Uh, we have no sense that it is going to be an improved position in terms of our budget, so that may mean we have to look at other departments and how we prioritise to meet the health needs. I call Cara Hunter. Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, in relation to uh, pressures on the health service currently, we do want to see health prioritised. But, Minister, I am also mindful that we have seen the biggest cut uh, in benefits by the British government since World War II, and I note, I note the mental stress that this has caused uh, for many people uh, who are on benefits. Will the Minister commit to working with the Communities Minister to give it back? Thank you. Well, as the member knows, this decision was taken in Westminster, uh, and any decision to give it back uh, should be taken in Westminster's interest, and there seems to be an attempt to pass the problem to one that is now the executive's when it is actually a decision that was taken over in Westminster. The Communities Minister has asked for an urgent executive discussion in relation to all welfare mitigations, including uh, the money that will be lost in that uh, end of the universal credit top-up. Uh, and I hope that that uh, meeting takes place as soon as possible. Of course, we have to then uh, discuss what we have in terms of our budgets, what we expect in terms of the spending review outcome. Uh, but I would say to the member that this decision should have been fought in Westminster. Uh, I, I understand it will affect people here, but it's almost as if the problem has been presented as if it is the executive's problem. The executive didn't cut this top up. The decision was taken in Westminster. At the end of June, the minister, in a written response, indicated to me that of the 769 million of Barnet consequential arising from allocations to the Department of Health in England, only 504 of that had gone to our own Department of Health. Could the minister give an update, if not today, by other processes, of what the present situation is in terms of the Barnet consequentials on health? and the actual spend of that consequential on health, because I think there is much talk and much concern about austerity, but we want to make sure that we are actually spending the money we get for health on health. Well, I, it goes back to, I suppose, the discussion in terms of the three-year as the one-year budget. If we get a barn consequential in-year, it has to be spent in-year. Uh, and if it's a substantial consequential, it may not be the case that health is in a position to fully spend that out. Uh, I will get the member uh, the detail, but I know that this year alone we have given over £70 million uh, to health additional to deal with, uh, with uh, waiting list issues. We are expecting a Barnet consequential of £180 million, which we will allocate as part of the October monitoring round. And health has asked to have all of that, and I would support that request from them and, and make a recommendation accordingly. But it is the case that with Barnet consequences, particularly those that arrive late in the year, it may be the case that health had said such a level of consequences could not be spent by them, uh, and they did not ask for all that. But I am happy to, to get the detail in relation to that and, and pass it back to the member. I'll call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. I'm just wondering about discussions or any um, update in terms of additional funding for healthcare workers, and in particular nurses' pay, and any discussions you've had with the UK Treasury around that. Thank you. Well, as the member will know, that the, the British government didn't make uh, the, the type of pay offer to healthcare professionals and nurses and others. Uh, so, applauding them outside 10 and 11 Downing Street didn't mean much when it came to actually allocating. Uh, 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 an amount in terms of a pay award. We have been discussing, uh, obviously the Health Minister has been discussing that pay award issue. They've also been discussing the additional uh, £500 pay. Uh, I know his department are progressing that at the moment. Uh, uh, and that's, that's where that is. is. It's the, their progress, not through healthcare workers. Uh, but certainly in relation to the pay awards for healthcare workers, it was very disappointing, but perhaps not un unexpected uh, from Treasury. Well, Diane Dodds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has uh, started to answer the question I was really uh, trying to get at, which was, does he and can he give the House an update on those uh, healthcare workers who are in the private sector in relation to the additional £500 that was promised to them? Well, I, I've seen responses. It's not, it's not the responsibility of the Department of Finance. We allocated, as, as the member would know from her time in the executive, we allocated the funding uh, to cover uh, those issues and the Department of Health is responsible for uh, distributing uh, I know they seem to have run into some technical and procedural issues which have delayed. The latest responses that I saw uh, were talking about this being sorted in the autumn. So uh, I know people are anxiously waiting on that £500 and it has been a subject, I'm sure, for all members of a lot of uh, inquiries. Uh, so I would hope that that is expedited as quickly as possible because I know uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to that and very much need it uh, in the time ahead. Nicole Robin Newton. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two. I was delighted to recently launch the new Civil Service Operational Delivery Apprenticeship Scheme alongside Minister Hargey and Minister Lyons to recruit 45 operational delivery apprentices. This is the largest civil service apprenticeship recruitment to date and offers successful candidates an entry-level route into a career in the civil service, allowing them to earn a wage while undertaking a work-based qualification over a two-year period. Apprentices who successfully complete their apprenticeship will progress to the next grade administrative officer within the operational delivery profession. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I just say, Minister, 45 apprentices out of, a, as I understand it, workforce of some 23,000 seems to be a very small number. But can I ask the Minister, in terms of what are the qualifications necessary? in order to gain a place? And can I ask the Minister, would he be mindful to give consideration to those youngsters who have been, in fact, underachieving at school and perhaps finding a route into the civil service within this scheme for those youngsters? Well, the, the apprentice scheme is only one of a number of, of, of options, and there are, the, I think, about 100 student placements as well, where people can come in uh, and, and work for a period and go back to their, their, their training. I, I, will, I will get him the exact entry requirements, but I actually think he makes a very valid point, and is one that we have discussed uh, on occasion in the department, that of uh, an opportunity for, for people who aren't achieving as they might have wished in school uh, to ensure that the civil service uh, has a very broad home for people uh, of all skills and levels uh, of education. So that's something that I will take away uh, and I will come back to him and report to him on any progress. But I think it's a, a very valid point in terms of these schemes. And I would like to see greater numbers uh, in these schemes. We are changing recruitment. We are looking at the whole recruitment practices as per the recommendation uh, from the Audit Office report. Uh, and there are a number of measures, including this apprentice scheme, student placement schemes, uh, open recruitment processes, uh, all of which I hope will have a transformative effect in the civil service. But I'm certainly happy to take suggestions from him in relation to that. Call McGuigan. Uh, Ken Collier. Uh, Minister, given the identified need for changes outlined in both the RHI inquiry and the capacity for capability review, can I ask you maybe to outline steps that you are taking just to improve recruitment in the civil service? Well, the, the reports uh, asked for uh, a review of recruitment, and that review is underway. I uh, have agreed the terms of reference for it, and an independent advisory panel of HR experts has been established to support the review. Officials are currently developing an overarching policy, uh, proposed policy framework that will set out the future approach that the civil service recruits and selects to ensure it is staffed with people who have the necessary skills and expertise. And while that policy is still under development, it will aim to open up the civil service recruitment and expand its resource mix, that is, the routes into the civil service, something the previous uh, speaker had, had been asking around, uh, and through the increased use of apprenticeships, trainee schemes and employability interventions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, the apprenticeship scheme is extremely welcome, albeit um, it should be probably expanded. But we also need to uh, fill the management staff cliff edge um, that the civil service face. When will the Minister announce um, a timescale for an extended uh, resumption? of the graduate programme, uh, as that SDLP is called for in the Make Change programme paper that we released a few weeks back? Well, uh, timescales in terms of the policy framework uh, in relation to the elements that come out of the inquiries is uh, intended to be submitted to be in, in October for consideration, and thereafter there will be detailed formal consultation with the trade union side and other key stakeholders. Uh, and that, that's. Uh, obviously, a fundamental requirement in terms of undertaking significant uh, work uh, to change. Uh, of course, we, we do want to see uh, the, these uh, schemes developed. We do want to see opportunities for more lateral entry into the civil service. We do want to see a transformation within the civil service. We want to see the contribution of regional hubs bringing people who previously would not have applied uh, to civil service because of proximity issues. Uh, so there are a range of different measures uh, all underway in relation to that. Some of them, I'm sure, because I did have a discussion with some of your colleagues in relation to the, the, the proposals that you as a party developed and uh, I invited them to engage with the civil service team that are working on this to uh, see where your policy proposals uh, match with those. But there are a range 
of propositions that are already underway as a consequence of a need anyway for change, but also as a consequence of some of the RHI and Audit Office reports. I call Morris Bradley. Speaker, question four. The actual amount of rates payable by a business is a product of the assessed net annual value NAV of the property and the regional and district rate poundages. A 2019 review of business rates highlighted the general feeling in the business community that the rates burden on businesses were too high. In response, I, I reduced the regional rates business, uh, business rate by 18% in 2020, and I have held the reduced rate for the current year as well. Businesses located in town centres have also benefited from $108 million per year worth of rate relief through rates holidays, uh, which has seen many town centre businesses pay no rates at all for the last two years. This is in addition to the $5.8 million of small business rate relief uh, awarded to town centre businesses. I have asked LPS to carry out a revaluation of non-domestic properties. A new valuation list will come into effect on 1 April 2023, based on the property market in October this year. This will ensure that businesses are paying rates based on values which take account of the market changes because of the pandemic. And finally, I continue to urge councils to show restraint in setting their non-domestic rates poundage in order that we can limit the business rate increases going forward. Morris Bradley, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. He's actually probably answered my supplementary as well. But uh, I was to ask the Minister had he had any assessment of what the impact has been on the 12.5 uh, per cent reduction of the regional rate during 2021 or the four month rates holiday of April, May and June and July 2020, or indeed the business support scheme. And if those measures turn out to have been a success, uh, does he envisage further help for our retail uh, sector in helping to regenerate town centres and keep business in business in town centres and not these out of town retail centres? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, the, the member's right. That, I mean, they, uh, I've I'm sure like other members have been out and about engaging with business and have taken the opportunity over the summer months to go out into different towns and engage with people who did benefit from rate support and rates reduction. Uh, and undoubtedly, it has, has, uh, the feedback I've been getting has kept a lot of businesses open. Uh, we obviously wish to keep them in the open in the time ahead. A lot of the money that paid for that was COVID money that we got from Westminster last year. Uh, and we have no guarantee of that level of funding, if any at all, in the time ahead. So I've asked the University of Ulster, who did the initial piece of assessment work in terms of which sectors most required intervention, uh, to do a further analysis of that to see if there's anything particularly we can do when this financial year ends and the, the, obviously the rates holidays that we introduce come to an end at that point. Well, public can the Minister tell us the value of rates support that has been provided to town centres this year? Well, the total value, I think, is over 100, uh, over 100 million pounds. Uh, I'm happy to give the member a breakdown town by town. He would be pleased to know that, that Derry got almost 10 million pounds of, of support, and I think Straban got nearly one and a half million pounds of support, uh, which is his own council area. Uh, but I'm happy to provide him with a, a full breakdown of each town. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, it's sort of been alluded to in the previous uh, answer, but business rates is by far the biggest uh, or, or, or one of the biggest uh, taxation levers that we have here uh, locally, the non-domestic rate. Um, but it's also because of the crisis hit by COVID, one of the most insecure. There's a fiscal commission looking at this at the minute, Minister. But what is your long-term vision of business rates? Because clearly it would seem to be unsustainable at the minute to have such a high burden of taxation on one area of small business and very little guarantee of it going forward into the longer term. Well, the member is correct in that uh, I think we get about 10 per cent of our intake in terms of, of uh, funding and finances available to the executive, which, as he, he will know, is used to support public services across a range of departments. So it's, it's a very significant uh, income for the executive. Of course, we want the burden of that to be uh, fairly distributed. Uh, and we had been hearing from businesses that they felt that the, the business rates were excessive. They have been reduced by 18 per cent. Uh, many people didn't, I suppose, get the full value of that because we also introduced a rates holiday uh, to cope with the pandemic. Uh, and we have kept that business rate down at 18 per cent. And we've been speaking to councils about the need to ensure that businesses can uh, recover from the pandemic. So in the longer term, I want to continue to review and engage with business organisations and businesses themselves. Uh, one of the other asks in relation to 
the non-domestic side was for uh, more frequent revaluation exercises, so you didn't get this significant jump in terms of the valuation over a longer period of time and, and, and the redistribution of that burden then having a more severe impact on some businesses than others. Uh, and so we've gone for a three-year revaluation exercise in the next, the next one, which is the, the shortest period of time between revaluation exercises that we've ever had. So it is about listening to businesses. It is about trying to work through a fair system uh, of rates, which takes account of the issues they raise. But of course, the, that uh, income for the executive is very important in terms of our public services generally. And given that we have faced uh, nine, ten years of austerity budgets, then we do need to rely on these things to supplement the income that the executive get. Well, Keith Buchanan. And thank the Minister so far for his answers. Minister, you obviously referred to rates, holidays, etc. And those rate bills are going to arrive back on businesses' mats, I presume, April time next year, May time. Is there anything that your department can do, or LPS can do, to ease that burden over and above what you currently do? You obviously can pay over a month and pay over a period of time. Is there anything else to relieve that shock which is going to hit those businesses? Well, they, they, as I said, they, 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 the ability of, uh, of the department to, to manage two years full rates holiday was due to the COVID money that we received and, and the, the real sense from business that the rates bill, as he will know, is one of the, the key burdens uh, that businesses have. And, and the feedback, as I say, from any of the business I've been speaking to is that that has been a lifeline for them. They recognise that the only guarantee was the end of this financial year coming. Uh, and beyond that, we don't and haven't have any indication of that uh, or any level of COVID uh, support that we previously got. We will continue to talk to Treasury about that. Uh, and that's why I have asked the University of Ulster again to look at a more specific target. And if it were possible, if the executive had the resources and the executive obviously agreed uh, to apply the resources at a more specific target to those sectors which were really struggling now, I think what we can all do is try and encourage uh, local people, as I know we're all doing with the, the voucher scheme that's coming out, is to shop local, to support our local businesses, to spend in our local high streets and our rural businesses as well, uh, to make sure that whatever spending power we have goes into supporting our local, our local businesses. I call Diane Dodds. Can I uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far? And he refers to the very considerable amount of support that was given to businesses during the rate, uh, uh, in terms of rates, um, and the, all of the other schemes that happened uh, with uh, the funding from COVID. Um, he also um, allocated 300 million for an economic recovery action package which uh, has been adopted by the executive and is fully costed a uh, set of interventions for the economy. However, some sectors of our economy continue to be closed because of the restrictions that have been imposed by the executive. As furlough ends, what provision can we make for those businesses to support them should uh, the decision of the executive still be to continue to close those particular sectors? Well, firstly, in relation to furlough, I have written to the Chancellor on a number of occasions, including recently, uh, to argue the case that they continue with the furlough scheme, even in a more targeted fashion, uh, because I do think that even as we emerge from the pandemic, thankfully, and we've been able to open up uh, a lot of uh, businesses in a lot of areas, uh, the economic impact of that will still continue with us for, for a significant period to come. The executive haven't taken the decision to close businesses, but I think some of the restrictions mean is that some businesses consider whether it's viable for them to open or not, whether it's commercially viable for them to open. Uh, but they aren't. Uh, we're, we were able to pay out in terms of when uh, the member was in her department and, and, and my department was on the basis of regulations from the health department which said you have to close and that gave us the various to be able to pay uh, people support for business. That situation doesn't exist. But what I do hope is that we do get the situation where restrictions can continue to be eased. And that obviously depends very much on the virus and the transmission in the community and people following the device and behaving sensibly, uh, and people uh, ensuring that our health service isn't overwhelmed. Uh, and so I think we're progressively moving in that direction. I know we're facing a difficult time over the winter. I know the health service is challenged. Uh, but I think if society as a whole can continue to cooperate with the advice that we've been given, then we will be out of this quicker and, and some of those businesses will be able to open up in a more commercially viable way. We call Mike Nesbitt. Question five, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, can Court I'll answer question five and thirteen together as they both refer to Peace Plus. The budget for Peace Plus has been confirmed at almost one billion pounds sterling. 
SEUPB is finalising the programme document which requires approval from the Executive, the Irish Government, the North South Ministerial Council and the EU Commission. It is planned to seek, an executive, to seek executive and North South Ministerial Council approval in October before submission to the EU Commission. This would allow the SEUPB to open the programme for calls in early 2022. The Minister publicly warned of a grave danger of losing the money if the DUP were to boycott the North South Ministerial Council. My question to the Minister is how much EU funding was lost in the three years following Martin McGuinness's resignation as Deputy First Minister and the consequence, uh, consequent collapse of the North South Ministerial Council? Well, the reality is, is probably none uh, because this is a new Peace Plus programme which requires approval to get running. The Peace, uh, Peace 4 was running over the course of the time, had all its approvals in place and was able to continue on as per approvals. So uh, I'm afraid the member's uh, question is misplaced. This is a new programme, it's Peace Plus. In order to get up and running over a seven year period, it requires its initial approval through the British government, the Irish government ourselves and the uh, North South Ministerial Council in order to go to the EU Commission for final sign off. Uh, and so that wasn't the case over that period. I'm sure he's relieved to know. There's a follow-on question there. The, uh, the DAP leader is uh, threatening uh, the stability of these institutions. And what, what would be the Minister's assessment of the DAP walking out of the executive here? What, what impact that would it have in terms of agreeing and allocating this funding, funding and getting it out into rural and, and indeed all community and voluntary organisations that, that badly need it? Well, firstly, I don't think we should be distracted by the behaviour of other parties uh, that much. We all have responsibility to get on with the work that we're elected here to do. Uh, but if the North South Ministerial Council was not able to meet in October, then it would not be able to approve the uh, SEUP proposition for a Peace Plus programme, which, as I've said, is just short of a billion pounds sterling, over one billion euros. Uh, and they Need, they allocate on a yearly basis to, to organisations saying which would apply for that funding. So that funding, that billion, almost billion pounds sterling, is allocated over seven years. Uh, if it's not spent year on year, then that funding is lost. So any delay to approving uh, the programme itself and allowing it to open for calls in early 2022 uh, would lose money on an annual basis then if it was not up and running. Uh, and so any interference in the north-south arrangements will have a very uh, detrimental impact on obviously border communities, rural communities, but also communities right across the north, working class communities uh, and others, community and voluntary sector groups uh, and very many capital programmes who uh, have applied in the past to peace uh, programmes but undoubtedly will be applying to this, which is a very significant programme which not only incorporates peace but also in the previous interreg programmes as well is incorporated in Peace Plus. So undoubtedly a lot of groups are waiting on this uh, as the funding from peace, uh, previous peace programmes starts to run out uh, and any delay to implementation of this will undoubtedly have a negative effect on it. Two minutes left, I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answers to this question uh, so far. Minister, Peace Plus funds are vital for people in cross-border communities. I know that too well as a representative of a border constituency. Uh, one of the major issues in border areas is the closure of banks, and Brexit has contributed to complexities of cross-border banking. What has your department done to protect the cross-border banking sector from the damage caused by Brexit? Thank you. Well, the member would know that we don't have a regulatory function for banks. Unfortunately, that resides in London. Uh, but I have met with the banks and, and bank leaders on a number of occasions. Uh, I have pressed them uh, not to be in the business of closing branches uh, in, in small rural towns, which uh, I think would have a very detrimental effect, regardless of the fact that banking practices have changed for people. Uh, undoubtedly, the loss of, of banks on, on small high streets does have a very negative impact. I have asked them to hold back on those decisions until the very least we emerge from the pandemic and have some assessment of the economic damage and what economic recovery can take place. Uh, unfortunately, some banks have pressed ahead with those decisions, and we will continue to press them uh, on that uh, and, and to urge that they, they, they hold back in terms of uh, negative decisions in relation to the number of branches uh, across Ireland. A new procurement policy note on scoring social value was published in July following endorsement by the Executive. 
In support of this policy, training on bidding for, pro for government contracts will be rolled out to voluntary and community groups. In addition, I plan to bring a new policy on the procurement of social and community type services to the Executive. This policy will ensure that when commissioning social and community services, departments must engage with communities and service providers to establish whether grant funding is a more appropriate mechanism. If procurement is the appropriate route, departments will be required to remove unfair barriers for community and voluntary groups. This policy note provides guidance on reserving contracts for the voluntary community sector and highlights the provisions within the existing procurement legislation to create markets solely for third sector bodies. Currently, there are only two local examples of contracts being reserved in this manner, and this needs to change. And that ends the period for a list of questions. Unfortunately for Mr McHugh, we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And topical questions 1, 6 and 7 have been withdrawn, and I move now to call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, during uh, the, the height of the pandemic, the business intervention grants were hugely welcome and have helped a lot of businesses through very difficult and challenging times. However, uh, there was money overpaid. How much money was overpaid? How much was paid in er error? How much was claimed fraudulently, Minister, uh, uh, during that period? Well, I, I, in terms of all those figures, I would need to come back to the member. I don't have them readily available to me. I, I know that the margin of error or fraud was, was relatively small, given as he uh, would understand the schemes were delivered in a very quick uh, basis, which wouldn't have been in the norm uh, for the particular schemes which, which give out money. Uh, there was a, a relatively low level uh, of either error or fraud, uh, and, and certainly a very significant level on follow-up ALPS to make sure where error occurred, uh, that that was corrected, uh, both in terms of people not receiving what they should have, but also in terms of people who received perhaps what they shouldn't have. Uh, the, the rules and regulations of that scheme changed so many times, uh, and at, at one stage I think there were probably 16 different iterations of it had come through. So it was a, a challenging scheme to manage. Uh, nonetheless, as he will know, uh, and I certainly know from visiting uh, a lot of businesses in a lot of towns over the summer, uh, the interventions were very much welcome, and they very much kept businesses alive uh, when the consequences would have been uh, very bleak otherwise. Supplementary, Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the, the Minister in terms of the importance of the intervention. However, Minister, there were uh, monies, public monies paid wrongfully or claimed uh, in error or wrongfully. What is your department doing to ensure that that public money is clawed back uh, to, to the centre? Thank you. Yes, what the LPS are doing is uh, where we have discovered that money was paid in error or indeed claimed fraudulently to pursue that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, certainly a significant amount of that has been returned, uh, and, and where people were overpaid in certain circumstances but were due a different type of grant, uh, then had they not got LRSS, we have managed to then have an arrangement with other departments to take it out of that rather than take the money back off that business but actually remove it from the, the grant they should have had or, and maybe uh, either re uh, recover the difference or in some cases uh, the difference was, was in the benefit of the business itself. So there has been a, a very proactive programme to try and retrieve any monies which were paid out either fraudulently or uh, in error. Call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, sir, New Decade New Approach contains a commitment within it to a review of arm's length bodies with a view to rationalisation, is the words used in the agreement. Can I ask the Minister for an update on where that process is at? Well, that, uh, we did begin a, a, a programme of work within the Department. We produced a paper for the Executive in which we did a, if you like, a desktop analysis of all of the arm's length bodies and where we felt uh, there should be, uh, and I agree entirely, it, it, it wasn't just an exercise in terms of review, it's review with a view to rationalisation. That means action will be taking place in relation to these. Many of the arms length bodies are a product of direct rule uh, administration, which, which they were created to try and create some veneer of local democratic input, uh, but are no longer fit for purpose. There is no very little standardisation between them, so a whole range of different functions, different arrangements in terms of their relationship with departments, different management arrangements, some are remunerated, some aren't. Uh, so to try and make sense of all of that and to provide a programme then for departments to say, you know, you really need to start proactively looking at these ones which are a responsibility. We will create a piece of legislation which may not 
be done in time uh, for this mandate, but uh, we, we hope that it will, uh, depending on what time we've left. And maybe the member could advise us on that. But uh, we will create a piece of legislation which will give departments the tools they need to do their own review and, and, and as, as we say, a programme of rationalisation and relation is. And I think we will produce a report annually so that committees can hold their individual departments to account to say, justify the existence of this. Uh, should it be brought back in? Should it be done away with altogether? Or should it be left as is? Or should it be reviewed to have its own functions in, in some way uh, looked at again? Uh, so there are a range of approaches to them, but what we want to do is get on and get that work done as quickly as possible and to give departments the necessary legislative framework to be able to undertake that piece of work. Christopher Stalford, supplementary. Thank you, and I welcome very much the Minister's response because I think this is an area of work that has just been left for far too long. Uh, if I could press the Minister a little further in terms of a time frame, in terms of putting those legislative provisions in place um, in an ideal world, independent of other political considerations, does the Minister have a time frame in mind in terms of bringing this process forward to a conclusion? Well, as I said, I want to see the legislation done in this mandate, and if it's possible to do that, we will. I, I've been doing meetings in recent days and uh, weeks with department officials in relation to this about progress in this matter as quickly as we can. Uh, what that will do is, is give, if you like, the basis legislation for departments to go off and do their own more in-depth review. We have done a desktop exercise uh, to draw attention to the departments of the, a number of, of arms and bodies that there are, the, 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 in our view, uh, what we think should happen to them, but I mean, it's obviously up to the department themselves. But if we give them the necessary framework to be able to do that, I would suspect it will be in the new mandate before departments start to conduct reviews. And whether they will do that on, on a kind of rolling basis and take some of maybe the more obvious ones uh, and consider those first. But I think one of the benefits will be an annual report, which means this assembly and the uh, committees within it can monitor each department's activity in this, in this regard. And call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister of Finance for an update on the Northern Ireland Civil Service domestic abuse workplace policy? Well, I know I think I've written to the member in recent times uh, in relation to this. I, I think, uh, if not, I've written to someone, someone in very recent times, but I think it was herself. And there are a number of workplace policies uh, that are being un uh, undertaken in reviews uh, by next HR, uh, uh, and this would be one of them. So I'm very happy to write to her with the full detail of the review where it's at uh, currently and, and when we hope to conclude that. Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And can I ask if the Minister agrees with me that victims and survivors of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland should be entitled to safely for, them, for their job, should they need to avail of it? Yes, I think we have to be uh, as sensitive as we can to people's individual circumstances. And I know there is a discussion. Uh, that's one of the key focuses as to uh, what time people are entitled to in order to, to deal with issues of domestic abuse and to, uh, in order to uh, readjust their lives if that is necessary, including uh, sometimes accommodation and other issues. So I do think that uh, policies need to be continuously under review to make sure that we have the most appropriate and sensitive and supportive policies of civil service staff in the time ahead and I hope that that, that 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 certainly would be my intention in terms of any review and that that would be the outcome but I, I'm very happy to correspond with her and if she uh, thinks that there are issues in it that perhaps aren't addressed sufficiently then I'm happy to hear from her. Call Colm Gildernew. Gormagat, Ken Corley. And Minister, I know you've touched upon the issue of RHA um, in, in, in your earlier questions but could you give us an update on where that uh, process is at present? Gormagat. Well, the RHI subcommittee met uh, on a number of occasions following the publication of the report, agreed uh, recommendations arising from the report, and I've been seeking to get uh, the executive to table uh, and uh, approve a report in response to the RHI inquiry. I have not been able to secure that, uh, despite submitting a paper on a number of occasions. Uh, and, and I hope to secure that in the near future because I think that uh, it is long beyond time and the executive had a formal response to the RHI inquiry. Supplementary, Colm Gildernew. And Minister, would you agree with me that improving recruitment to the civil service is crucial in addressing the deficiencies highlighted by RHI? And can you outline the ongo ongoing work in relation to recruitment to the civil service? 
Yes, I, I do. It, but I mean, civil service issues were one part of that. There were a whole range of, of things, and we have improved things like the codes for ministers, the codes for SPADs. Uh, some of that work has already been done and brought forward through the Assembly as well. Uh, but there are a range of measures, uh, some of which flow from the RHI report and the Audit Office report as well into recruitment. Uh, and we have undertaken reviews of all of that policy, initiated some new measures, and we will continue to do that because I think uh, it was very obvious that. Uh, we needed transformation within the civil service anyway, but I think the RHI inquiry uh, brought some acute attention onto some specific areas of, of uh, skills uh, and uh, competencies uh, that were necessary within particular functions within the civil service. So we need to have a more agile civil service that can recruit uh, the necessary people in to do specific tasks at specific times. The following two questions have been withdrawn. I call Nicola Brogan. I got a um, will the Minister recommend that the budget gives priority to health so that transformation can be delivered and that waiting lists can be reduced? Yes, uh, I think uh, that is the case. The executive, as I have said, uh, has, has al always had a priority in relation to health and agreed. Uh, I think when we first came back in 2020 that in order to try and take the politics out of health that we would have a whole executive approach to supporting the requirements of the health service. And in the time since, uh, obviously, that has come into even more sharp relief because of the pandemic experience. So we are now in a situation where uh, we had wanted multi-annual budgets to allow us to properly, uh, having done the reports, the Bengoa and other reports, uh, to actually then allocate the resources to uh, create transformation and tackle issues like waiting lists uh, and other problems within the health service. So it is now time, as we're setting those budgets over the next three years, to, to try and prioritise and to match those priorities with the resources necessary. We hope for a better outcome in the end of the spent review. We may not get that, and that's why I've asked departments to look and the executive to look at how we would support the prioritisation of health, the health service and, and health spending generally uh, in, the, in the circumstances where the budget outcome wasn't as good as we hoped. That means uh, perhaps uh, asking other departments to, to offer support uh, in terms of health provision, uh, in, in terms of the finances they would have received. Uh, and I know some ministers have indicated a willingness to do that, but that may well be one of the options that the executive have to look at over the next couple of weeks. Dr. Madri, Nicola Brogan. Jeremy, I can call and thank the minister for his answer there. Just following on from that, then, um, can the minister give an update on the introduction of multi -annual, the multi-annual budget process? Yes, I have written. We spent the summer, uh, my own department, engaging with other departments in terms of planning and prioritisation for multi-annual budget. Uh, I have written to uh, the, my executive colleagues and spoke to this at the executive meeting on Thursday uh, in relation to a planning session that we want to bring forward uh, next week, uh, in which we, uh, we focus entirely on this uh, budget process. And in, in some ways, uh, it can, the fact is that this is the budget for the next mandate. Uh, actually can have a liberating effect on people because they can take off their departmental hat uh, because they will be planning a budget for a department they may not be minister for uh, beyond an election. Uh, so I think we can have a more holistic executive conversation around all of this, agree the priorities. Uh, as I say, my view is that our priority remains health uh, and that will take a very substantial underpinning with resources and that we agree those priorities and we agree how we're going to match them uh, and, uh, and ahead of the announcement at the end of October in terms of the outcome of the review. I call Patrick de Lage. Call Diane Dodds. Yes, can I thank the Minister uh, for his answers so far, particularly around the issues of how we build a more agile civil service and how we build a workforce for the future, responding to all the challenges we have. And I know that this is a huge project um, that has to be undertaken. Can the Minister tell us how uh, he is engaged uh, with the unions um, over uh, the return of civil servants um, to the, the workplace or in, in office working. Um, and we are also, just to record, immensely grateful for all of the work that has been done in keeping us safe and in producing all the question, schemes please. that they did over the COVID pandemic. Well, I, I agree with the members' uh, closing remarks in relation to the, the work that has been done. Uh, the, we are planning a return uh, as we 
sensibly should do, because at some stage we will get that message uh, from health in, in terms of a safe return to work. And so we need to be ready for that. I think work is going to change, not just in the civil service, but change right across all uh, large-scale employers. Uh, and we will, we will be planning for a more hybrid uh, type model, a blended model as it's called, where people will be working sometimes uh, at their desk and other times uh, working from a remote location. Uh, and so I think we have to plan that. Obviously, business area by business area, it depends on the nature of the job each civil servant is doing as to whether they're required in an office or whether that flexibility is built in. So I think we're going to see a very different system. And of course, uh, that's an ongoing discussion with the unions to make sure that people uh, are uh, aware of what those arrangements will be, that workers are aware of their rights within those arrangements, and that we get the best possible outcome in terms of new way of work. And time is up. Um, can members, please take a raise for a moment or two before we move on to the next item. Order, Mr. Chambers. Speaker, uh, could I apologise to you in the House? Uh, I was not in my place for.